I'm going to invite these them up eat as a group, and they're each just going to have a couple minutes to sh to talk about their project. So it's going to be very quick, and I'm sure you all know that researchers have a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> giving high level. So we'll see how this goes. So the first group is the Urban Forum group. We have uh, Jan Kestens from Université de Montréal, Brent Hagel from University of Calgary, and Lise Gauvin from Université de Montréal. So I'll get you all to come up all together, and then we can go through each of your projects. And just a reminder too, they're in the uh, little handout on your tables. There are uh, descriptions of each project, so that'll give you a bit more info. All right, so who's who? You, yes, okay, you go first, go for it. Yeah. So two minutes, right? Two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wasn't warned that I would be first, so, I, but uh, I'll try. <laughs> um, do we have some slides uh, for that? We had slides. I don't know if they're meant to be up. If you just move this forward, it oh, should be okay. there. Here we are. Okay. All right. So I'm starting with Interact, our project. So Interact is a collaboration of researchers, public health practitioners, urban planners, um, uh, community groups working together to understand how cities transform, change, and how these changes impact uh, health and equity. We've actually put in place four natural experiments in four cities, in Vancouver, Victoria, Saskatoon, and Montreal where we follow people, we've created cohorts, uh, and follow the transformation of the city uh, around issues of sustainable transformation and uh, sustainable transportation and urban design. Um, and we focus on physical activity, uh, well-being, and social connectedness. And more recently, we are also, we've also uh, increased our work uh, on equity. So Interact, uh, since the last seven years, we are still running. Um, we have developed uh, a solid research infrastructure on intervention research, which we believed back in 2016 uh, was highly needed in, in Canada. Uh, so this research infrastructure is composed of, of cohorts, but also tools and methods uh, to follow um, transformations of the city, uh, spatial and, and, and uh, policy analysis tools, uh, qualitative methods, um, ways to gather data in the city, bring it together, uh, exchange with our partners, and create uh, evidence. So that's one of the achievements. Um, we've also uh, managed to develop sustainable and strong uh, partnerships. Um, and it's our partners who have really helped us throughout these years orient our research agenda and, and, and help us define uh, the topics of interest in each of these cities. Um, that has brought us to create local evidence um, around, for example, uh, cycling or gentrification impacts of health. Um, and we've also managed with this research environment to uh, get additional grants and branch into different fields, for example, gentrification and health, implementation science. So we've been actually quite successful uh, in leveraging this uh, infrastructure for additional funding. As you can see in these slides, a few uh, key numbers of our achievements. Um, and I will finish, because I still have 28 seconds, um, <laughs> about our, our, our also achievements in terms of diversity of outputs. Uh, we've done flash reviews, we have a number of uh, papers, blogs, uh, we have a GitHub uh, environment to share uh, all our uh, methodological tools. Uh, we have uh, annual data briefs with our partners, uh, advisory committees that are still active, and uh, we've been also using social media uh, to share our key messages. So we hope here we're going to be able to exchange with uh, most of you and, and learn from your experience and hopefully uh, share some of our tools and methods and approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Forward, Brett. Right. Uh, fantastic work. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there we go. 
All right, so um, I'd just like to first off acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 of Southern Alberta and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you today about the Child Act of Transportation Safety and the Environment Program, and I'm representing some really amazing colleagues, uh, and I hope I do them justice today. So our goal was really to understand how the built environment influences child and adolescent active transportation uh, and the risk of active transportation injury across different Canadian urban settings. And we had very specific objectives uh, and a number of projects within each objective. And so um, I think we were able to accomplish uh, the establishment of uh, prevalence estimates for active transportation in school children uh, across seven municipalities, uh, noting uh, the wide variability even within uh, cities in this outcome. And then we related that information to design, density, and diversity components of the built environment um, to try and understand what factors are influencing uh, active school transportation, and importantly, what factors are influencing the risk of an active transportation injury. Uh, and in contextualizing that information, we were able to look at um, qualitative work uh, focusing on barriers to built environment change and decision making uh, and facilitators uh, and noting that motor vehicle prioritization is a huge issue uh, in municipal planning. Uh, and I'm also very proud of the fact that our program was able to train a number of postdoctoral fellows, graduate students and uh, initiate uh, the undergraduate researchers uh, within our respective universities to uh, the research enterprise and built environment. And so um, focusing in on what we're able to accomplish, summarizing that, I think we need to prioritize social equity uh, in planning road safety interventions, and you've heard a little bit about that, and I've given some examples here. Uh, we've understood that there are different built environment, active transportation, and collision associations uh, between cities requiring the need for uh, local knowledge and interventions. Um, we've established um, before and, and fostered throughout this program of research, municipal partner um, researcher partnerships. Uh, and I've given a number of example projects here that I'm happy to talk about later. And then infused within the research program were a number of knowledge translation pieces, uh, including uh, acquiring the input of our partners, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, at the beginning of the research program and throughout, um, we developed a webinar series. We have a projectchase.ca tool uh, for understanding um, safe ways for kids to navigate the built environment and what that looks like in terms of built environment change. Uh, developed some infographics and then we have a Chase database um, that I think will be uh, a, a nice legacy of the, the program that we can use to understand um, further the relationships and es perhaps establish baselines for further research. Uh, and none of this work would have been you know, possible without an incredible number of partners. Uh, and, and I'm delighted that um, we've established some really strong relationship with, relationships with those groups and want to continue doing so in some of the, the work again that I can talk about in future directions later. Thank you very much. Great. Over to Lise. Thank you. So my name is uh, Lise Gauvin, and I'm here with my colleague. Uh, so I'm Lise Gauvin with my colleague uh, Nazim Muhajarin, and uh, we were leading the MUSE uh, THEPA project, and we were very, very fortunate to have as partnered knowledge users the Urban Public Health Network and Corey Newdorf, uh, who you heard uh, earlier this morning. And so two of the themes that we heard a lot about this morning uh, were the focus of our project. One of them was intersectoral or multi-sectoral partnerships. And so a significant portion of the work that we have accomplished focused on collecting data from partnerships that were located in four different cities, Vancouver, Saskatoon, Toronto, and in Montreal. And we've conducted surveys and uh, interviews to better understand the composition, functioning, and interventions that emerge from these different partnerships. The second focus of uh, our work was on understanding the acceptability of built environment or urban form transportations. And so we know that we have to have information about prevalence, about uh, burden. We know that we need to know about the efficacy of interventions that we're learning about uh, in Interact, but we're interested in uh, implementation considerations. If populations are not on board with what, are be, what is being done, likely we will not have 
the um, appropriate uh, reach. And so we conducted a survey on the acceptability of built environment transformations to the food environment and to the transportation environment. And because the survey was done during the COVID-19 pandemic, we also collected some data on transformations that were elicited as a result of some of the COVID-19 pan, uh, pandemics. Uh, the COVID-19 confinement uh, procedures. And so we went into the 17 largest census metropolitan areas in Canada and collected data on 27,000 people. So some of the things that we um, have actually identified is that we were able to identify a certain number of facilitators and barriers to multi-sectoral or intersectoral collaboration. And both of and these uh, uh, barriers and these enablers were both intrinsic to the uh, partnerships, but also to the extrinsic, um, uh, the extrinsic, extrinsic environment in which people are uh, functioning. We also were able to um, identify how uh, multi-sectoral partnerships think about and use an equity lens. And what we identified was that it was quite a bit more complicated than we originally thought. This has just been recently been published in that it has to do with framing, it has to do with core competencies, it has to do with prioritization, it has to do with uh, the fact that equity is more of an emergent concept than something that is very specific. And we believe that to be actually interesting and useful in uh, not just saying to people you have to address equity, but to say maybe we have to do multiple things to be able to um, address this. In terms of the um, acceptability of built environment transformations, um, what we were asked was about uh, the agreement that with a hypothetical implementation of services, facilities, regulations, and policies that would be within a 15-minute walk in some people's neighborhoods. And what we found was, in fact, that um, these are some weighted prevalences that uh, when you have things that are not very intrusive, like communication or providing information, it's mostly very acceptable. But as soon as you start implementing incentives or disincentives or eliminating choices, then there's a lot of pushback that actually occurs. We found that, in fact, there was a gradient. We also found that um, some of the lower rungs on the ladder, like information, don't always appear to be most acceptable. Many analyses show that um, women were actually much more uh, accepting of different transformations, as were people who self-identified as being uh, uh, of um, uh, as being uh, indigenous. And some are lower income. Uh, populations also showed greater acceptance for food system uh, transformations. And so I look forward to chatting with anyone and everybody who comes to chat with uh, our group a little bit later on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, all three of you. So so once again, these, these three are going to be a trio in one of the World Cafe sessions. So if you want to learn more about these projects, choose them uh, in one of, your, one of your rounds. So next round, we're going to... Um, this, now we have the Obesity and Environment Group. Uh, so we have Philip Awadala from University of Toronto and Danny Duaron um, from Canoe to come up. And, I, and, and now we're, we're going to, is anyone, does anyone bet? Is anyone a gambler? So here's the, here's the challenge. Can any of these people actually keep to two minutes? Yeah, it's always a bad thing when, when anyway, okay. You're first. Go. I'm wondering why that was started with me. <laughs> uh, first slide, I guess it's me. Nope. This is you. No. This is not us. No. Oh, okay. This is me. All right, this is me. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, so uh, our project was on the, uh, specifically asking questions around is it genes or environment that impacts uh, traits associated with metabolic, pheno or, uh, metabolic disease or metabolic phenotypes in general? And so overarching programs in my lab and with a number of activities uh, that I'm associated with are trying to ask those types of questions. Ancestry, somatic mutations as we age, environment, and potentially epigenetics. How do these all contribute to development of chronic diseases? And specifically, we're interested in, under in understanding how gene by environment interactions impact metabolic traits. Uh, to do this project, we decided to leverage um, in, our pro in our funded activity the CANPATH cohort. I'm the National Scientific Director of CANPATH, which is hosted out of the University of Toronto, where we've recruited over 350,000 participants. 
Uh, it's still growing because we're still engaged in recruitment in Manitoba and in Saskatchewan, which are our more recent partners as well. And one of the things that we were able to uh, leverage there as well is our consent to uh, uh, use our six-digit postal codes or three-digit and six-digit postal codes of our participants to link to environmental uh, outcomes. So a lot of the inf this is just a kind of a, give you an idea of how we're doing with regard. How am I doing for time? Oh, wow. All right. So we captured this type of information. We captured a lot of omic information, and we used the uh, canoe project in especially the fellow who's sitting right beside me, who I don't have time to introduce, um, to just look at environmental contributions. We started in Quebec, and then we started moving outwards to the rest of Canada. One of the reasons we started in Quebec is we can control genetics much more easily in a population like that, which colonized uh, Qu uh, Quebec around 400 years ago, to ask simply whether genetics in these three cities contributes your response versus environment uh, in these three cities to uh, health outcomes. So really that's the question we wanted to ask and very high, oops, this kind of didn't come out. Um, Canoe provided us with information about air pollution in each of these three cities. And so just to be really fast, this is the outcome of the Nature Communications paper that was published in 2018, uh, is that generally your environment rather than genetics is really what's most critical with, respond to how, how, with, with respect to how you respond to the environment. Lots of uh, media impact, even uh, Marie-Julie Fave, who was the lead author on that paper, was even on CBC uh, not that long ago. In fact, when every, any time anything comes up with regard to air pollution and health outcomes, this, this, uh, we, we get a phone call. Uh, we're working in CanPath, we're working uh, across uh, Canada now. One of the things that we can easily say is that air pollution, or PM2.5, explains cardiovascular risk or cardio mass, cardiometabolic phenotypes in our cohort more than any other trait that we've measured. I know I've gone over time. And the last thing I want to highlight is this paper was a cover came out two weeks ago. Actually, Christopher Carlson's head popped up on an, on an image. He, his, his cohort in BC contributed a significant amount of data to this. We also contributed information from what we learned in CanPath. It's a really nice study led by Charlie Swanton, who I think had three full articles in Nature in the last two weeks showing that uh, environment, PM2.5 in particular, and its impact on your inflammasome had a significant impact in never smoking uh, lung cancer's development. So that's a pretty important development, I think, as well. So. Great. OK, over to Ben. All right. Hello? Okay. Yeah, so I'll try to keep it to two minutes. So uh, Canoe's main uh, contribution has really been the establishment of a central uh, data portal of, its in, of environmental exposures. Um, so since 2016, we've collated and developed for, uh, over 45 nationally standardized data sets uh, that are indexed to the Cana uh, Canadian six-digit postal code. Uh, to link up with cohorts such as uh, CanPath. So we make this data available via our own data portal, but we've also pre-linked them uh, to CanPath, to the CLSA, to the child study, and to a number of ad administrative uh, health databases. Uh, so in addition to uh, building a data platform, uh, Canoe has established a multidisciplinary network of uh, researchers, professionals, and clinicians. Oops, sorry. And um, these data sets and collaborations have uh, resulted in important contributions to the advancements of environmental health research in Canada. So from 2017, uh, which is the uh, year which we uh, started um, distributing the data to today, uh, we have uh, received over 400, well over 400 data requests, uh, which have led uh, to more than 135 scientific publications and 20 graduate student theses. Um, yeah, so Canoe's uh, public webinar series has, uh, has been an effective tool in knowledge translation. Uh, over the years, we've hosted over 40 public webinars um, on key and emerging topics in environmental health. And these webinars were well attended, attracting between 50 and 100 people per event uh, from Canada and abroad. And uh, we also recorded the webinars and made them available on our website. 
Uh, CUNU also developed a series of training uh, uh, sessions uh, in data science and health geography uh, in collaboration with the GeoHealth Network and Population Data BC for students from across the country. And finally, with support from the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, we launched the HealthyDesign.City uh, project in 2020, uh, which really um, uh, pushes the democratization of CANU data uh, in that we want to lend CANU data to so uh, solutions-oriented uh, initiatives. Um, so via uh, development of web-enabled uh, tools, uh, we are making CANU data available to individuals from outside of academia to look at issues of environmental equity, uh, to uh, encourage public engagement and education in uh, built environment and health. Okay, thank you. Still a no, better still a no. Um, okay, so this, uh, is this right? Yeah. Okay, so the next uh, the next group is uh, child health. So we have uh, Vernon Delinsky from University of Manitoba and. Okay, Megan Jones is here as well. <laughs> and, and PJ Sabaro from the Hospital for Sick Children. Okay, so I don't know who's first, but if you click the slide. Okay, great. Yeah, first, good afternoon. I'm Vern Golinski, and on behalf of my team, I'd like to tell you about uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity, which is, you know, a, public health crisis in Canada. But particularly, uh, you know, troubling is the fact that uh, is also is rising rapidly amongst pregnant women and their children. And youth onset type 2 diabetes is, you know, a really major health concern because the, uh, of the prognosis for poor cardiovascular health outcomes as well as kidney, kidney loss and uh, other complications of diabetes. And First Nations uh, children are, uh, you know, disproportionately affected by these conditions. So one of the factors, even though we don't know what the mechanisms for that aggressive nature of type 2 diabetes is, uh, you know, one of the factors that we see is that the maternal environment defines a major role in the uh, risk for developing obesity and type 2 diabetes in, in youth. So consequently, we assembled a, a large team to investigate this. Uh, use basically uh, experts in metabolism and epigenetics and united four different uh, cohort studies that I show above, which includes two First Nation cohort studies and two population-based studies. And then we also included uh, animal model systems to uh, investigate tissue level mechanisms and uh, genetic polymorphisms as well. Ultimately, our work has identified a whole series of epigenetic and metabolomic biomarkers and mechanisms of uh, type 2 diabetes in adolescence. So the uh, implications of this, we hope, will lead to you know, targeted interventions that can really kind of shift that uh, tra intergenerational trajectory. So as shown above, from you know, that high risk uh, trajectory, intergenerational trajectory shown on the inner circle to more of a healthier uh, cycle as shown on the outer circle. Thank you for your attention. I could actually keep within the two minutes. Okay, so on the top um, right panel, uh, type right side, is the team that this grant was able to bring together. Um, and we focused on breastfeeding, home environment, genetics, asthma and lung growth, viruses, nasal microbiome, and maternal nutrition. And I just wanted to point out that Zihang Lu is an early career investigator who's here at the meeting today. So I'm really pleased if you guys want to talk to him as well about this study, he can really illuminate you. Um, on the bottom panel 
in the in the circle plot are all of the various factors that we looked at in the child study, which is a national cohort of infant um, who have been followed now to age 12. Um, and we looked at each domain, and, and you see in the outer circle how we the different things that we looked at within each domain. Um, and infant feeding as breastfeeding was actually one of the, the big factors that will come out uh, of the story. Um, the big thing that we found from this, from this body of work and in child in general is really um, honing in on the fact that uh, genetics and environment obviously contribute differing aspects. But for asthma particularly, we found that in children who are at high risk, um, only 12% of it is explained by their genetics or genetic risk scores that we've used, whereas over 30% of the environment could be linked to, to um, explain the increased risk for asthma. This is all obviously very complex, and when we start to look at individual factors and what you see on the bottom left is a complex gene environment relationship, and in this case, I didn't want to put it on, on the slide, but it's around breastfeeding, which is always very contentious in the asthma literature because in general, breastfeeding is extremely helpful, especially if you're at low risk, but in the very distinct situation where you are high risk for genetically and you are producing specific HMOs um, that are associated with being high risk for asthma, you can actually increase the risk of asthma in your child specifically. But again, this is very hard to message to the community and so I really um, think the next phase of, of the work is in the top uh, left panel where you see we're taking all of the risk factors together and looking at it in the context of the microbiome. We've already seen that viruses do shift the nasal microbiome um, and they are, there's a complex relationship that's influenced by many factors including the environment. And one of the top risk factors for asthma that was um, that one of the things that came out was phthalates, and we're really interested in understanding how these environmental factors can influence the nasal microbiome and lung function and symptoms. You tried. I tried. <laughs> um, so I'm not Stuart Turby. Uh, you can tell that I'm not Stuart Turby because I don't have an Australian accent. Um, unfortunately, Stuart couldn't be here. He's the PI of the project. Um, and you can see that the, the major leadership team for this program, project, which was trying to link modifi modifiable environmental factors in the development of asthma. Um, I'm highlighting two people there. One of them is myself. The other is my colleague, Dr. Hinspihi, who is here. And this is sort of the first main takeaway from this project that I think is really important is, is we were both postdocs when we worked on this project. Um, so it was a really amazing training opportunity for us and helped us springboard our careers into the next phase. So I'm now an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba, and Dr. Spihi um, is really putting her research and policy into practice uh, working for the BC CDC. So the overarching idea behind this project was linking um, modifiable environmental factors in a very complex way um, to the development of child asthma and allergy, and we're using the child cohort, so this is perfect, perfect and aligned really well. Um, and, but we are mechanists. We wanted to look sort of really deeply at a couple of different mechanisms that link these two things together. When Stuart presents this work, he focuses on the microbiome because that's his thing. I'm an epigeneticist, so I'm going to talk very quickly about some of our findings in the epigenetic world. So for those who aren't familiar with epigenetics, we like to refer to it as a sort of form of cellular memory. It is how cells, individual cells, remember past environmental exposures and how those exposures can then be sort of retained in the long term and go on to influence cellular function and then health in the long term. So we wanted to see how specific environmental exposures linked to childhood um, asthma and allergy through the epigenome. Um, and so we have a couple of main things. Um, one is epigenetics linking child traffic-related air pollution, specifically to ATP. This is the analysis that Dr. Spihi and I did together. Um, we found that, that that link happens at least in part through the epigenome. The epigenome itself has an, an independent connection um, to both traffic-related air pollution and childhood um, ATP. Um, some ongoing work that from my lab, my independent work, is looking at this in a longitudinal fashion. So how long do these things stay behind in the epigenome? Are they continuously linked to childhood asthma development throughout life? Um, this is still under review right now at EHP, so if Dr. Kaufman is still online here and you want to help us out, that would be great. 
Um, and then the last thing is something that is sort of the, the other main takeaway, which is springboarding the findings from this into the next step. What is the next thing we're going to find? Um, and so we're actually looking at diet moderation. How, do, how does diet, specifically things like antioxidants, actually break those links at the molecular level between air pollution and child health? Thank you. I'm excited to hear what everybody else has to say. Awesome. Thank you. So once again, this is the child health. Oh, I need to give you your handouts. This is the child health group, so there'll be another group. Um, and next up, we have the microbiome group, which is, yes, good. Um, Alberto Martin from University of Toronto, Alan Stinsey from University of Ottawa, and Jennifer Gomerman from University of Toronto. And I think it's the, the order that's listed. Go for it. No. Okay. So I don't have slides, which means I might be able to keep it under two minutes. <laughs> so th the main objective of our research program was to characterize the complex interaction among the diet, the gut microbiome, and the host in the context of pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. IBD is a chronic inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. The cause of IBD is unknown. And unfortunately, it is a lifelong disease with no cure. Before the start of our project, we knew that the gut microbiome plays an important role in the onset, the progression, and the remission of the disease. This same gut microbiome is also known to uh, digest our food and produce uh, beneficial essential metabolites. And some of those metabolites are known to educate the immune system and therefore might modulate uh, the gut inflammation observed in IBD. So with our project, we propose to test the hypothesis that disrupting the interaction among the diet, the gut microbiome, and the host leads to IBD, and that ma by manipulating uh, this uh, interaction, we might be able to improve treatment response. So during our project, uh, we uh, discovered uh, new insights into the interaction among the diet, the gut microbiome, and the host. Our findings reveals an alteration of both the composition and the function of the gut uh, microbiome. The IBD microbiome was characterized by a decreased production of beneficial metabolites from the fermentation of complex carbohydrates, together with an increased production of detrimental metabolites produced from the fermentation of proteins. These findings suggest that we might be able to manipulate the gut microbiome by using specific complex carbohydrates in order to improve treatment response in IBD patients. As part of this project, we also discovered uh, biomarkers that could be used to diagnose IBD, differentiate the two subtypes of IBD, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and predict severity of inflammation, which is critical to determining the optimal treatment for the patients. So our project uh, highlights uh, the uh, importance of studying the gut microbiome in IBD pathogenesis and provide novel avenues for the development of therapeutic approach aimed at manipulating the gut microbiome and, and managing IBD. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, my name is Alberto Martin. I, you know, it was an honor to work with this team of clinician scientists and basic scientists that explores the role of, you know, microbiome and other environmental factors on colon cancer. As you know, colon cancer is one of the most prevalent cancers in the world, uh, and it's multifactorial. Its cause is multifactorial, meaning that there are a number of different factors that are being implicated in colon cancer, uh, such as genetics, immune, the immune system, or dysregulated immune system, such as which occurs in IBD. Uh, these individuals are also very uh, predisposed to develop colon cancer. But it's also, compo you know, there's also factors that are environmental, such as a diet, and, and more recently, the gut microbiota have also been linked. And there are a number of pathobionts uh, that are being linked to colon cancer development. And so what our project, one of our projects, and the one that I'll tell you about today that's uh, currently under review, is uh, how we, you know, uh, understand or, or explore how these various factors cross talk with one another to uh, induce uh, disease. And so what we've been doing is taking these pathobionts that are common in all of us, about 
30 to 40 percent of us have these pathobionts and screen them and look for interactions that cause synergistic effects on colon cancer development. You know, and so what we've done is taken, for example, this E. coli mutant, uh, this E. coli or a mutant, so it's called NC101, and try explore different diets. And for example, what you can see here is a low carbohydrate, low fiber diet on its own promotes colon cancer, but when you add this uh, uh, bacteria called E. coli NC101, it promotes it. Right? Uh, while this bacteria on its own would not normally do that uh, with other diets. And so what we ended up showing in this study is that uh, this low fiber diet causes this E. coli variant to grow and cause DNA damage because it encodes uh, genotoxic agents. And so what we've been doing really is also exploring whether this pathobiont also in interacts with other factors such as genetics. And we found, again, a, a very, a, a, an interaction with this pathobiont and a genetic mutation that occurs very frequently, colon cancer. And when you combine all these three together, we get what we call the perfect storm in colon cancer development. And so the take home message uh, is that a diet rich in fibers uh, will protect you from colon cancer caused by this common E. coli uh, bacteria. And, and I want to add to that we have a lot of human data that supports this finding. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of Gemini. And this is a team that has assembled expertise in immunology, microbiology, gastroenterology, epidemiology, health geography, genetics, and nutritional sciences. And our goal is to understand how the Ontario environment is impacting the development of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, such as asthma, IBD, and multiple sclerosis. And these diseases have um, quite high incidence and prevalence in Canada. So for example, Canada has the highest rate of multiple sclerosis in the world. Um, moreover, the incidence of these diseases is increasing at an alarming rate. In contrast, um, the incidence and prevalence of these diseases is lower in other parts of the world, and we focused here on South Asia. And Canada, and specifically the Greater Toronto Area, hosts a large South Asian diaspora, which includes newcomers from India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. So our team, which uh, Gemini, it, uh, and we have two other members here, Iqbal Noir and uh, Gary Chow, um, found that people who immigrated to Ontario from South Asia, who we term um, first generation, had a low risk of developing one of these diseases. However, South Asians born in Ontario to first generation um, South Asian parents, in other words, second generation South Asians, had the same risk of developing one of these diseases as the general Ontario population. And that given that Canada welcomes many newcomers often to the GTA, this is an environmental experiment that's literally unrolling on our doorstep. And while it's unfortunate that second generation South Asians are experiencing this heightened risk of um, inflammatory disease, it, we consider this also an opportunity to study what drives this increased risk and learn more about the Ontario environment. And we know that the microbiome is exquisitely sensitive to environmental inputs, including diet, pollution, et cetera. And so with CIHR funding, we assembled this team to study the highest risk for chronic inflammatory diseases among South Asians, um, looking for hot spots in the region of Peel using postal code data to gain clues about environmental risk factors. We also recruited 100 first generation and 100 second generation South Asians who generously provided their blood and fecal samples and answered a lot of environmental survey questions. And then we analyzed the fecal microbiome. And we found that second generation South Asians entirely lack specific microbes that are relatively common in the first generation's uh, microbiome. And by comparing these microbiomes with other studies looking at inflammatory disease risk, we've generated new hypotheses to test the involvement of the immune system. And ultimately, we're going to need to understand if these microbiome changes imposed by the Ontario environment are causally related to the increased disease risk that second generation South Asians experience. And lastly, we learned a lot about this community, including their barriers to healthcare use, their knowledge of chronic inflammatory diseases, and quality of life impacts that could impact our ability to treat this at risk population. Thank you all. Great. So, this was the microbiome group. So next, we're going to go to the resource development group. Um, so Margot Parks, University of Northern British Columbia, Nicole Bates-Emer from University of Victoria, and Michael Unger from Dalhousie. 
And I believe you're first because you're listed first. So. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, the, I don't have slides, so I'll just try and do this au naturel. Um, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about the project we're going to call. It has morphed into the name the Resilient Youth in Stressed Environments Project. And this project is taking place in Drayton Valley, Alberta, and Secunda, uh, South Africa. What we were actually starting out to try and do is look at the impact of environments at both ends of the carbon cycle, communities that produce heavy industry, oil and gas industries, and those that are being affected by climate change. But as the project has evolved, what I really want to sort of focus on, at least for this, is actually what we're learning about from the communities where there's heavy oil and gas production. And this is in South Africa and Canada. And the reason we're focusing on that is because we're beginning to understand that the, by living in these communities and indeed caught up in this oil and gas production, there are dramatic impacts, of course, uh, that we're beginning to show, thinking multi-systemically about, for instance, the world price of oil has a dramatic effect on family dynamics and ultimately on rates of depression in children in those families. So we're approaching the entire study from a multi-systemic frame of resilience, which is an emerging discourse, at least in, in the frame of resilience and sort of resonating here in this room, certainly. Overall, what we're trying to understand is the cascade effect. So, if you're in oil and gas towns, you need to begin to think about identity formations of these communities. You need to begin to think about macroeconomic factors. Um, we need to begin to think about the impact of those on family dynamics and even down to the kinds of natures. And we have data like this that will actually talk about green spaces and blue spaces. So what we've done is we've combined all that data with things like uh, measures of hair cortisol and depression and psychological and family dynamics. And we've gathered all this incredible data and we've been struggling to try and figure out new and innovative ways of using these different scalar sort of um, data sets and using network analyses and other things that we're now in the phase of actually publishing. Um, if you do want to read a fair bit more about this, we did manage to put out a volume with Oxford University Press that's open source, open access, which makes it much more accessible to our global community of scholars, especially in the uh, low and middle income uh, settings. But essentially, that's our mission, to better understand how to help or ultimately, since they're producing the carbon, these communities are going to have to go through a dramatic change in the near future. And what we hope we're actually doing is entering the conversation early enough to help them to begin that process of change and what the impact's going to be. Thanks. Over to Nicole. Science. Oh, you did have slides. <laughs> oh, get rid of it. Oh, sorry. I wasn't sure if I sent anything, so. <laughs> okay. Hello? Okay, great. Um, so I'm a brand new postdoc on a shared future. Um, and a shared future is about reconciliation between indigenous and Western knowledge systems in the renewable energy sector in Canada. It explores how different, different knowledge systems have the potential for healing our relations with each other and with the world around us. It's the only EHSI program to be funded through the indigenous ways of knowing stream. And there are eight thematically linked projects studying uh, intersectoral partnerships across the country, as depicted in this image by artist Sam Simon Brescoupe, who joins us today, who, along with Elder Barbara D Dumont Hill, are key members of the team. They've been really instrumental in guiding the team with, for example, this visual to think kind of conceptually across the projects, which you see around the outside, um, and how they're linked through the four elements, which you see on the inside. In terms of main accomplishments, a shared future is co-directed by Heather Castledon, a white settler researcher, and Dee Lewis, a Mi'kmaq researcher, and they created a co-directorship to decolonize the typical hierarchical CHR leadership model. In addition, each governance committee has at least 50% representation by Indigenous peoples and at least 50% by those who identify as women. Uh, second, our gender champions formed a partnership with the Native Women's Association of Canada and produced a compendium to support our team to incorporate sex and gender-based analysis and to take a decolonizing approach to gender. This helped amplify Indigenous women's voices across the renewable energy sector and center gender in all, all of our program discussions, etc. 
The team published a policy brief with the Yellowhead Institute critiquing the absence of indigenous rights in clean energy programs and policies across Canada. And perhaps most importantly, a key hypothesis emerged, which we are working through now, about whether energy sovereignty is a core determinant of indigenous people's health. In terms of knowledge translation or excitement around uh, communicating, um, within the program, uh, each of the eight projects has a community or an organizational co-lead who themselves are knowledge users um, to ensure that projects are community-based and community-led and that findings are of use to and shared with communities. We've held two summer institutes for our trainees and teams and an annual winter retreat for our programmatic steering committee. And then finally, beyond the program, the team has produced nine academic publications, a piece in the conversation, three videos, one with almost 2,000 views, and participated in a podcast. And finally, we're working on new KT products now, which is part of my responsibility, including business cases and developing an edited book or a special issue, and finally, a final documentary project. Thanks. All right, is that working? Okay, we are, uh, I am, we'll go to the, my slide if that's there. Ah, there it is. Whoops, back. We have one slide and three people. And we are representing, please come on board, Chris, and uh, we are representing the Environment, Community, and Health Observatory Network. We are embodying the importance of that trio. Uh, and we are here to just give you a glimpse of the strengthening intersectoral capacity to understand and respond to the health impacts of resource development. In our two-minute glimpse, we're going to share with you three catchphrases that have really leapt out of us in terms of the importance of this work and hoping that you'll come to learn more. And the, a key essence here is that our team was fo focused on knowledge exchange partnerships from the very beginning, and that map on the bottom left, where researchers and our regional case partners um, all ex shared and exchanged knowledge throughout. And a strong message from that group is that we want to expand our suite of approaches to thinking about these issues. We do not want to be, you all know the metaphor, people for whom, who are holding a hammer for whom everything looks like a nail. That we need to expand how we think about environment and health research. And so we had these three phases, taking notice for action, connecting that all the way through, integrative tools and processes, not just the tools, but the processes to mobilize them. And you're gonna hear for 30 seconds from Chris and Celine about those and about given the paucity of integrative environment, community and health work, um, the need to connect and amplify. So over to Chris. Thanks, Margot. Uh, Chris Busey, like Megan, I'm someone who benefited. I came into the ECHO project as a postdoc and found their way into a tenure track position now at Simon Fraser University. I was really fortunate to be the co-lead for our stream on integrative uh, impact assessment. And we were fortunate to work with knowledge users who are very familiar with how we govern resource development in this country, looking at tools like environmental, social, and health impact assessment. The number one complaint, they're very rarely brought together to make sense of very complex social ecological systems. So we drew some inspiration from some tools, legacy developments, uh, environmental justice screening tools developed by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, these are tools that are geospatial, they're equity informed, uh, they track cumulative effects over space and over time. They've been trialed in 17 different states. We thought, why not in Canada? So we've led multiple successive pilots. We're not going to share the results. You got to come to the table to find out more. <laughs> of course, as Margot said, the tool is only as good as the process that's paired with it. Yeah, and very quickly, we did think a lot of, about processes. Processes are important to build the tools, so we need to be building them with the people that are going to be using them. And they, they help to start intersectoral conversation to bring us forward. They create co-benefit. And I'm heading back to Margot. And so the conversations that we had were uh, moving from cumulative impacts to co-benefits. They were about connecting and amplifying what we already know to elevate place-based work that is really resonating. We were hybridizing tools. And importantly, as you can see with some of our graphic work, we were creating arts-based work of how to bring things together and not have them separately when we're thinking about uh, environments, ecosystems, equity, and health. I'm out of here. Margot looks at me like th she thinks she did a good job, <laughs> which she did, but not in the time allotted. Raisa was part of our team. I was part of this team. So when they came up with three people and Celine said to me, we're doing this the echo way, I was like, I know what that means. Okay, last, last but not least is the agri-food group. 
Um, Sherry Lee Harper, University of Alberta, Norman Newman, University of Alberta, and Barbara Hales from McGill. Does this mean we get more time? No. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm Barbara Hales. Um, as, as was mentioned, we're in the agri-food group, and our goal was really to develop innovative approaches to ensure that safe alternatives replace endocrine disrupting chemicals, which we call the legacy chemicals. And examples of the legacy chemicals are the bis bisphenol A, which I think everybody knows about, the brominated flame retardants and phthalates and their legacy because they have been, or at least some members of these families have been regulated. So hopefully uh, our exposure to them is decreasing. We had three specific aims, um, exposure assessment. So uh, this was led by Cindy Goodyear. Um, so we were looking at which of these legacy chemicals and which replacements are in uh, drinking water, in foods and in uh, breast milk and samples were collected from Canada and South Africa. And Jonathan Chevrier is sitting over there and he is our Mr. South Africa, the total liaison with South Africa. The second specific aim was led by Bernard Robert and that was really to figure out what's known about the new chemicals that are replacing the legacy ones. We know quite a bit about the legacy ones they've been studied, but we know almost nothing about some of these new chemicals. And so we used um, high content imaging. Um, we studied a variety of cells related to development and reproduction. And we looked also at some organ cultures to see what we could find out about these basically unknown compounds. The third aim was led by uh, Jay Ellis and she was interested in, in policies and regulations. If I can get it to go forward. Um, I went backwards. Okay, so I'm only going to tell you about one family of chemicals, and it's the one most people know about, which is bisphenol A and its replacements. So remember, the question is, are the replacements regrettable or responsible? What we found out in this one example is that um, legacy and replacement compounds are found in food from Montreal and South Africa. Um, cooking did not reduce exposure very much. And interestingly, and this has attracted a lot of um, press is that the thermal labels on your food, so when you go to the grocery spot store and buy fish, for example, or other foods with thermal labels, are a dietary source of one of the bisphenols that's replacing BPA, BPS, and this has attracted attention. Amazing to us, even in plastic water bottles, and fortunately there were none here except for the juice maybe, um, did not have any bisphenol A, um, so we were surprised by that because we thought it would. Um, and however, human milk has BPA, BPS, and some of the other bisphenol type compounds. Um, I didn't put it on the slide, but it's likely that they are also found in milk in South Africa. So when we put these chemicals in our in vitro screen assays, we find that the effects of these chemicals are chemical and cell line specific. And we can actually rank the chemicals so we can know which bisphenols are safer at least based on these assays, than bisphenol A. And we've done exactly the same types of studies for the flame retardants and their replacements and, and also for plasticizers. So I was interested to hear about phthalates earlier because phthalates obviously is legacy and some of the others are replacements. Um, when we do organ cultures, we find that they are um, also have effects on development. So the, this is only possible with a really interdisciplinary team. So you can see on the top, the people from McGill, we come from five different faculties at McGill. So we were really learning each other's language and how to communicate. And I was interested to hear some comments about that this morning. Cindy Goodyear led the studies um, in terms of the breast milk, collecting them through the, um, in both countries. In, in, in South Africa, they're actually collected from a urban region and from a, a very um, rural region. So we have data there too. We have amazing colleagues from government, from Health Canada, um, both from the Chemicals Management Plan and some of the research labs, and then many, many um, collaborators, colleagues, um, knowledge users um, from th 
things such as the Environmental Food Safety Agency to food packaging to um, Environmental Defense Fund. And that was it. Great, over to you. Great, thanks. Do you ever wonder where it comes from? Water. Do you ever worry about the safety of it when you drink it? If I told you this water came from the toilets of all of Ottawa, would you drink it? Even though I said it was safe as an environmental microbiologist, that it met all safety requirements. Some of you are probably going, what the heck is he talking about? Why are we that desperate in Canada to have to drink somebody else's toilet water? And the answer is, well, yeah, we hold 7% of the global freshwater supplies in Canada. It may seem like we're not ready for this. But in reality, certain parts of the country are. Southern Alberta, for example, is an area that's facing some dire consequences over the next 10 years. We have three problems facing us in Southern Alberta and the Southern Prairies. Climate change, so you remember the heat dome that occurred that will, could be more frequent. The floods in Calgary in 2013 were once in a century floods, floods predicted to be now once every decade. Okay, so we're gonna have to balance abundance with extreme drought. We have scarcity. We can't draw any more water out of the rivers. By regulation, we're not allowed to draw any more water out of the um, rivers in southern Alberta. And yet, the Calgary municipal uh, area uh, grew between 2011 and 2021 by almost 250,000 people. Essentially, every decade, a large city gets popped down in Alberta somewhere. How do we meet that need? Part of our goal is to look at water reuse. How do we reuse water more effectively? Could we ever be ready to bake our toilet water into drinking water? We call that direct potable reuse. And in certain parts of the US where we expect the mega drought, you've probably heard of the mega drought. We're at the beginning phases of a mega drought that could last a thousand years. What might that mean for water quality and would come all the way up into the Southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba areas that mega drought? Are we ready for it? Um, the city of Okotoks just announced, for example, it's a small city, about 30,000 people just south of Calgary, has just announced that they will run out of water in nine years, and economic growth and development will cease in nine years. The city of Cochrane, just west of Calgary, has announced the same thing in 10 years. So we need bays to supply water to people in the next. Perhaps the most startling discovery we made as we started looking at this is how do we make wastewater safe? Let's look at the pathogens that might be present in wastewater and how do we make it safe? We came across a very surprising thing because some microbes actually survive wastewater treatment. And when we actually went in to look at how they do that, we came up with a remarkable finding. That in fact, it's almost like they're wearing microbial Kevlar. They're resistant to treatment. Now, that, that may not seem big to people, but when you realize that drinking water and sanitation are the two greatest interventions for control of infectious disease in modern society, and they might be evolving resistance to water treatment, might we have a big problem? I can tell you that those that do survive treatment are also highly multi-drug resistant and antibiotic resistant as well. So could we actually be creating the ultimate superbug? So I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Great, thank you. And we do have Sherry Lee online. So go ahead, brief overview of your project, please. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I wish I could be there in person today to be joining all of you, but I'm in Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory. I'm calling in for Papa Stewlands. Um, and it's great to be able to, to chat very briefly about our project. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen and go through a couple of slides. Um, so our research uh, was uh, Indigenous community-led research. So I'm here today on, on behalf of the, the real leaders of, of this research, um, Inuit in the Arctic, Chaiwi in the Peruvian Amazon, and Batwa in, in the Ugandan Impenetrable Forest. Um, all three of these different groups have been experiencing different climate change impacts. Um, so for the Inuit, that's changes in um, ice extent and, and thickness. Uh, for the Shawi, uh, lots of changes in terms of flooding, which is really important for their agriculture. And for the Batwa, a lot of changes um, in their um, in, in rainfall, which has really important implications for their uh, rain-fed agriculture. And so all of these um, different peoples have been impacted by climate change and have been experiencing really important impacts on their food systems, on their indigenous food systems. And this became a clear priority in our proposal development stage. 
And as we have worked through the project um, over the years, what's really interesting is that even though these are very three different, three different, like very, very different groups in different countries, um, high, middle, and low income countries, very ind different Indigenous peoples experiencing different patterns of colonialism um, in, in the past and in present day, um, different cultures, different climate, um, different languages, different right across the board. Um, but the pathway through which climate change impacts food systems and impacts their health um, are all strikingly similar. So things like racism, colonialism, um, inequities, all of these things um, really exacerbate some of these climate change impacts on their food systems. So um, our project, um, you know, we, we had an Indigenous-led uh, team. The majority of our team members were Indigenous, majority were female identifying. Uh, we had over 30 different partner institutions involved in the project. Lots of masters and, and PhD students involved in the project, um, including those who are Indigenous. Uh, lots of different people uh, participating in, in our research in different ways. But what I wanted to do is, is share with you one different um, output from our project from each of the different regions to sort of highlight the, I, I guess, more unconventional research outputs. Of course, we had publications. Of course, we had you know journal articles and, and book chapters. But here are some of the, the community um, uh, uh, outputs that were really, really important to different communities. So the first I wanted to highlight was from Peru, from the, the Amazon. Um, the Ministry of, of Culture there actually requested this. Um, they were really interested in knowing the nutritional content of different um, in Indigenous foods in the Indigenous food system. Um, so we worked with the different uh, Shaiwi households to create this, this book um, that outlines the different nutritional contents of the different foods and how that's being impacted by climate change um, for the ministry. Um, in Uganda, we, we worked on a project that looked at how community members were adapting their, their food system in the face of climate change. And this was a photo-based project. So using photography, we documented the Indigenous food system um, from, from the source to how it's harvested, to how it's prepared and how it's consumed, and the values and processes that go behind that. Um, and, and created an online resource um, as well as a you know paper in hand resource. We also had tra traveling photo exhibits with this um, that that communicated uh, from I guess from farm to fork in a sense um, for this indigenous food system and, and how it was being impacted by climate change. And the third and final project that I'll highlight under under this this uh, this major project uh, was from the Arctic. Um, so we partnered with communities. Um, in Labrador to look at how climate change was impacting the food system there. Um, and, and one food source that we focused on was caribou. Um, caribou are experiencing a, a serious uh, population decline right now in, in Labrador, and that's for a number of different reasons, um, but one of the reasons is, is climate change related. And so what we did is we partnered with communities to create a documentary film that talked about how the declining caribou herd populations are impacting Inuit, how that's impacting their food system and how that's impacting their mental health and well-being and their nutrition. Uh, but not only the impacts, but also the responses and what can be done to, to overcome that. Um, and this film was aired on, on CBC last year. Um, it's available on CBC Gem if you're interested. Um, it was also aired on PBS in, in the United States. It's been presented at film festivals and has won awards and has been a really effective way at communicating some of the, the key research results of our project um, to a much wider audience. But across all three of these examples, I wanted to highlight three key messages that came out really, really clearly in our project. The first is that Indigenous knowledge systems are really critically important in understanding how climate change impacts Indigenous food systems, um, different responses that are available um, in the face of climate change, but also how to, to govern climate change impacts. Um, I, across the projects, uh, it became very clear that Indigenous self-determination self in research is really, really critical. Um, and finally, um, that there are climate food health so solutions available um, um, in, in this context. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Um, thanks so much.